I'm sorry. I'm sorry again. I know I keep saying that I'm going to start doing these faster, and then life doesn't let me do that. We had a tornado go through my neighborhood, and we lost internet for an entire week. And then the weather has pretty much rained every single day. So, but I'm here now. So let's get started. First up, I have a new high frequency word. That's what HWF stands for, if you are not familiar. This word is pronounced honto, and it can be used by itself or with the particle me. It's honestly used very similar to how we use the word really in English as like an expression. Really? Is that true? Are you sure? Are you telling the truth? It's got kind of that sort of meaning. So we have this poor girl here who has gotten a zero on her test. I really studied. And the boy's response is, Honto desu Notice that this one doesn't have the particle ni. It's ever so slightly different. In this one, he's trying to confirm that what she said was really the truth. Did you really study? Are you sure about that? This word is used all of the time. So make sure you add it to your vocabulary. You learned all of the prepositions that you need in the last lesson. So now let's talk about how to use them. If you look at the top of this page, you'll notice the particle no. We actually learned this particle back in lesson six of the beginner course. In that lesson, you learned no as a possessive particle. Like watashi no would be mine. To make things easier for you, I want you to keep thinking of it as a possessive particle. So you can think of this as it's, it's the space that belongs to the object. So if I say, skue no shita, that is the desks below. It's the desks under. It's the under that belongs to the desk. If you think of it this way, it will help you remember which particle to use. Skue no ue, the desk's top, right? In English, we wouldn't say that. We would say the top of the desk, right? Underneath the desk. English is very complicated. We have to change a lot of the grammar depending on which preposition is being used. The Japanese is pretty straightforward. Just remember, place, no, preposition. Hako no, the boxes, naka, inside. Hako no ushiro, the boxes behind. It's pretty easy and it doesn't take that long to get used to, but I do have some examples. So we're going to take some of those vocabulary words from the previous lesson in combination with those prepositions to make some simple sentences. In the first example, we have Byouin no migi ni gakko ga arimasu. First up, which one is which? What is Byouin? Is it the school or is it the hospital? What do you think? Pause if you need to think about it. It's the hospital. The hospital's what? What is Migi? Migi is right. So the hospital's right. What is there? Gakko ga arimasu. There is a school. To the right of the hospital, there is a school. What if I flip that around and I use the exact same words, but I change the preposition? Now it says, Gakko no hidari ni byouin ga arimasu is the exact same sentence, but now it says, to the left of the school, there is a hospital. Gakko no, the schools, hidari, left. Then we have the particle ni. If you don't remember this particle, go back to the beginner course and review it. But ni can be used for just about any preposition. It means, in this case, to, right? To the left of the school, what is there? 
yoinga arimas, right? Arimas means there is. What is there? A hospital. Let's try with some new words. Read it yourself. See if you can figure out what it means. Pause if you need to. Eigakan no mae ni kare ga imasu. Hmm. What exactly is this sentence saying? Does it match the first picture with the man standing in the front or the second picture with the man standing inside? Think about what each of the words mean. Eigakan is movie theater. What about mae? What is mae? Is it in front of or is it inside? It's in front of. In front of the movie theater, right? The movie theaters in front, the space belonging to the front of the movie theater. Imas, right? Because a man is alive. We can't use arimas. If I wanted to translate this into English in a way that sounds natural, I would put he first. I would say he is in front of the movie theater. Right. In English, we tend to use the active voice. We don't go to the passive voice very often. But this sentence, if I translated it literally, would be in the passive voice. In front of the movie theater, he is there. Right. That's passive voice English. But it sounds weird. We don't talk like that. So we would want to change that into active voice. But in your head, no one can hear you but you. So remember, in your head, translate it the way that's fastest. And the fastest way to translate it is to just read it as it is. Read it in the word order that is there. Don't try to flip-flop it and change the words around in your head. It takes way too long. The only time that you need to worry about changing the word order is if you're trying to translate for somebody who doesn't speak Japanese. So, if I wanted to change the sentence and say that the man is inside of the movie theater, I only need to change one word. Which word do I need to change and what do I need to change it into? Pause and think about it. I'm going to change mae to naka. Naka is inside. Eikakan no naka ni kare ga imasu. He is inside of the movie theater. I have a little practice quiz here, but I'm going to do a voiceover for this part because the questions are going to be in a random order. So if I try to record it now and then try to record it again on my computer later, the questions are not going to be in the same order. So you're just not going to see my face for this part, or maybe I'll record it in the office when I actually record the lesson. I don't know. I'll figure it out, but you may or may not see my face for this next part. Okay, so I have a sentence here. It is in English. We are going to translate it into Japanese and, you know, finish the picture. So the only thing that you need to do is tell me the preposition. How do I say on the table? Start with that. And then if you want to say the whole sentence, I'll show you how to in just a second. But how do I say on the table? What's that going to be? It's going to be table no now, if I want to say put the candle on the table, the word for put is oku. So if I conjugate that into the present tense, it's okimas. And then candle is rousoku. So I can say table no ue ni rousoku o okimas. Put the candle on the table. Really, this should be in the te form, not in the simple present form, but you don't know the te form yet. Technically, this would be more like place a candle on the table, but it has pretty much the same meaning. It does sound a little bit strange. We would usually put this in the te form because it's like a command, but we'll learn about the te form later. So don't worry about that too much right now. Again, we're just focusing on the prepositions, all the other vocabulary words and things are just kind of extra for now. So let's go on to the next example. For this next one, we want to say, put the plant on the left of the sofa. That sounds like bad English to me. I feel like it should be to the left of the sofa. Maybe that's American English versus British English. I'm not sure, 
but it sounds strange to me. Anyway, we're not worried about the English. We are worried about the Japanese. So first, how can I say to the left of the sofa? What would that be? Sofa in Japanese is just a katakana word. So it's literally sofa, right? So sofa no hidari ni. And then if I want to say put the plant, plant in Japanese is shokubutsu, right? Animal is doubutsu, plant is shokubutsu, and then okimas again. So sofa no hidari ni shokubutsu o okimas. Place a plant to the left of the sofa, or I place a plant to the left of the sofa. You should actually be able to do this next one on your own. If you did your homework in the first course, the beginner course, because a pillow or cushion is one of the vocabulary words from book one. It is makuda. So if I want to say, put the cushion on the sofa, how could I do that? Hmm. Sofa no ue ni makura o okimasu. I place a pillow on the sofa. Okay, this one's a little bit tricky. It says above the chair. Now, there is a word in Japanese. We can use it for multiple things. Which one do I need for above? Do you remember? It also means on or on top of. So above is actually also ue. So if I want to say put the picture above the chair, it would be isu no ue ni e o okimas. Picture in Japanese is e. Just just e all by itself. It's kind of a strange word. <laughs> but e e e o okimas. Put a picture above the the chair. This is another one that you should be able to do by yourself. The word newspaper was in the homework of the beginner course. Take a minute, see if you can figure out the whole sentence all by yourself. How would I say, put the newspaper on the chair? It's gonna be, isu no ue ni shinbun o okimasu. Okay, we finally have a new preposition. We've used ue several times now. This time we have under. Put the remote under the sofa. Remote is a katakana word and it's rimo, which comes from the word remote. And then kon, which comes from controller. So it's an abbreviation pretty much. And it's rimokon, rimokon. So put the rimokon under the sofa. Sofa no shita ni rimokon o okimasu. Put the remote under the sofa. All right, we're going to start going a little bit faster now. I feel like you guys probably got the gist of this. So this next one, pause if you need to. How would I say put the books above the sofa? Sofa no ue ni hon o okimasu. Technically, you could also say hon dana because you do magically put a random bookshelf over it. <laughs> but the, the sentence calls for just the word books. Put the books above the sofa. Okay, next up, put the cat under the table. What do you think? Table no shita ni neko o okimasu. For this next one, key in Japanese is kagi. Kagi, so... Hmm, put the keys under the chair. Isu no shita ni kagi wo Tissue in Japanese is another katakana word. So, sofa no mai ni tissue wo okimasu. Put the tissues in front of the sofa. Okay, you may have noticed the random lamp that magically appeared. Uh, we skipped that one because it used the word Ida, which is between. Uh, so the last one is put the bag on the right of the chair. Isu no migi ni bagu wo Hooray! Great job, guys. You did it. Now that you have a variety of grammar under your belt, 
let's experiment with making different types of sentences. So I have a sample sentence here. First, let's take a look at it and see if you can figure out what it means. The first example says, Toshokan no yoko ni kouen ga arimasu. Toshokan is library. The library is what? Next to or beside, yoko. Kouen ga arimasu. There is a park. There is a park next to the library. Or, literally speaking, next to the library, there is a park. What if I want park to be the topic of my sentence? How can I rearrange these words to do that? Think about what the topic particle is and the grammar that needs to follow. Pause and think about it. The topic marker is wa. So I'm going to mark my topic, which is park, colon, wa. All we have to do now is bring down the rest of the sentence. Toshokan no yoko ni arimasu. That's it. Easy peasy. But I can also use another no. I can say Toshokan no yoko no koen. And it's pretty much the same thing. There's a very slight difference in the meaning of these two sentences. The first two mean there is a park next to the library. The bottom one makes it possessive and it specifically means the park next to the library. Now let's practice kanji. This time I have a word that contains the kanji. I will tell you what each of the words mean and the reading for that word is there in furigana for you. So all you need to do is think about the meaning of the word and figure out which kanji makes the most sense to fill in the blank. Are you ready? Our first word is konshu, which means this week. So knowing that it means this, this current week that we're in right now, which kanji do I need? Think about it. It is this one. Next up, we have hanabi. We talked about hanabi specifically in the last lesson, so you should know this one. What do you think? Hanabi means fireworks. Fireworks. What do you think? It's a flower of fire, a firework, a hanabi. Which kanji is it? It's this one. Next up, we have swimsuit, which is mizugi. Mizugi. Water clothes. What do you think? What is mizugi? Which kanji do I need? Pause. It is this one. Next up, we have Ichiban, which means best or the most or like first place or things like that. This is an old kanji. One of the very first ones that you ever learned. That's a big, big hint. Which kanji do I need for Ichi? Ichiban. It's this one. What about Wakaru? To understand. Hmm, we also called this one out because this kanji is a little bit weird. The kanji means a part of something, but it also means to understand. Which kanji is it? It's this one. Next up, we have sengiri, which means thinly sliced. But the kanji literally means 1,000 slices, 1,000 cuts. That's thinly sliced, right? We put thinly sliced meat on our sandwiches. So which of these kanji mean 1,000 or 1,000 in general? Think about it. It's this one. My microphone died, and I didn't notice 
until I was all done recording. Isn't that great? I can't catch a break. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, so from this point forward, uh, you're just going to hear my voice. I'm going to do a voiceover instead. So our last kanji is ganki. Ganki. You have probably heard this word before. It's one of the very first words that you learn when you start learning Japanese. It's also the name of a very famous textbook. So genki. Genki means like lively. We use it when we say that we're like doing fine. Someone asks you how you're doing. You respond with genki desu. I am fine. That's you are. Genki desu. I'm so great. I'm so lively. I'm full of energy. So the kanji that you need is the one for spirit. You'll find this kanji in words like electricity. What do you think? It's this one. Okay, here is the real test. Because as you learn kanji, you're going to start seeing them in books and on signs and all over the place. You're going to have to read them without furigana. So here, the ones in red are words that you've learned already. I want you to try to read the sentence without looking up the kanji characters. So take a minute and pause if you need to. The first kanji means three. The second one means year. They are read together as san nen. So this is read koko ni. San nen kan sundeimasu. I have lived here for three years or for a period. That's what con is. Con is like a period of time. I have lived here for a period of three years. Okay, this next one has three kanji that you need to know, but two of them are part of the same word. Remember what we said about the compound kanji and how it changes the pronunciation? If you can add a dakten, we usually do add a dakten. So, what do you think? Pause. I'll give you a hint. The first word is a day of the week. Which day is it? We have the kanji for moon, and the kanji for day, and then the last kanji is the kanji for come. So, this is red. Kare wa. He will come on Monday. Or he is coming on Monday. That's what this sentence means. This last one is a little bit tricky. And honestly, you will probably only get this one if you studied the kanji cards from the JLPT lessons. But even if you can't read the sentence, that's fine try to figure out the meaning of the kanji at the very least. So what do you think the first kanji means? What does the second kanji mean? The first kanji means behind or back. In this word, it's kohai, kohai, which means like junior. The second kanji is the kanji for gold. And this is kompeito, which is the little sugar star candies. So this sentence is read. Watashi no kohai wa kompeito ga suki desu. My junior, watashi no kohai, my junior, kompeito ga suki desu. He likes, or she likes, we actually don't know the gender in this sentence, but he or she likes sugar stars. That's what this one means. And we are all done. Good job. That was a lot of hard work. But you stuck through it, you made it to the end, and now you are one step closer to becoming fluent in Japanese. I will see you guys soon. Bye!